Well, hello again and welcome. Um, tonight we're going to be discussing the parable of the herbs, which is actually from the Lotus Sutra, and it's a parable that's a favorite of mine. Uh, hopefully it's June 14th, but if you're watching a recording of this, it might not be anymore. Uh, if we made it a year from now, please let me know how things are going. So, with that, <laughs> next slide, please. So, just by way of introduction, the parable of the herbs is actually from chapter 5 of the Lotus Sutra. So at this point, we're actually into the story a little ways. And the Lotus Sutra is known for the series of parables that are told in the first half of the Sutra. So this parable is, uh, in my experience, it's kind of a crowd favorite. Uh, it's technically in the Kumara Jiva version, not exactly a parable, though. And one of the reasons that people like it is I think it has a very inspiring sort of message about pluralism and the universality of Buddha nature and the Dharma and these sorts of things. So it's a very sort of reassuring and inspiring chapter. And it's kind of nice as well because in chapter two, we were introduced to the sort of core chapter of the first half of the sutra, which is about the notion of skillful means or upaya. And in that chapter, Shakyamuni Buddha reveals that the Shravaka and Pratyeka Buddha um, vehicles, which are sort of the main Theravadan vehicles, uh, were presented as a skillful means where he was hoping to bring people up to a level where they would be able to accept the sort of teachings that go beyond what he believed they were receptive to at the time. And so this is sort of one of the ways that in Tiantai and Tendai Buddhism, we kind of explain the various teaching periods of the sutras that um, Koshin and Sensei have both given presentations about in the past. So at this point, we already have uh, two parables, the parable of the burning house, the parable of the poor son, which were chapters three and four. And chapter four is a little interesting because actually four of the Buddha's disciples, uh, Subhuti, Maha Katyayana, Maha Madhyayana, and Maha Kashapa, actually recite this parable to the Buddha to make sure that they understand correctly what he just taught in chapters two and three. So when we reach chapter five, the Buddha is responding to Kashapa as the sort of stand-in for this first group of ascetics that were the people that he was practicing with when he decided to leave that group and sit under the Bodhi tree and then attained awakening. And so these were sort of his first disciples as well. So they're very cultivated and have been there for a long time. Now, another thing that's special about this chapter is that in many ways it hints at the content that comes later in the sutra in chapter 16, which is really the second core chapter of the Lotus Sutra. And depending on who you want to talk to, uh, chapter 16 is the real core or chapter 16 is the second core. Um, and there are really two chapter two and chapter 16. And this is the chapter where it's revealed that the Buddha is sort of always operating in the world. When he passes into Nirvana, he isn't really extinguished. There's sort of the universality of the Dharma always here guiding and helping us and always there to be discovered because this is the nature of the sort of truth that's beyond our lower T conceptions of truth. So one of the things that I particularly like about this uh, chapter is that it really conveys the idea that there's no one who's excluded from the Dharma with a capital D, the teachings of Buddha, the truth. The Dharma is for everyone because it's fundamentally a part of who and what we are. If you are what you eat, then surely we could say that if we're nourished by Buddha nature, we are also that same Buddha nature. And in this sense, we see early hints again of this sort of notion that comes up in chapter 16 of the eternal aspect of the Buddha, or a sort of Buddha nature that nourishes all things and is the life force driving the universe. Gene Reeves in his book, The Stories of the Lotus Sutra, which is sort of a commentary on the Lotus Sutra, um, encourages us actually to read this chapter a little bit anachronistically, which I thought was interesting, so I wanted to bring it up in the introduction. And he says that we can actually find in this chapter a call to repair the delicate harmony of nature, which he sees as a harmony that human beings have intentionally disrupted through the use of large-scale destructive weapons and the industrial pollution of air, water, and soil that we certainly depend on, but also all other beings on the earth. Next slide, please. And so with that, I'm going to get into it. So the general story of this chapter begins with Shakyamuni Buddha responding to the four great disciples that were previously mentioned, Subhuti, Mahakachayana, Mahamadgalyayana, and he's addressing Mahakashapa directly as the sort of spokesperson for these four. 
And the Buddha explains that as a Tathagata, in other words, one who has sort of gone beyond, gone to the truth, and then come back from it, he always tells the truth and always speaks skillfully. And this is by virtue of the fact that, and this is quoting from the Sutra, a Tathagata observes and comprehends where all teachings ultimately lead and also knows the deepest working of the hearts and minds of all living beings, fathoming them without hindrance. Moreover, having thoroughly understood and exhausted all teaching, he manifests this totality of wisdom to living beings. Then he uses a simile to explain how a single teaching could be manifested in a variety of ways to different people. And at this point, we get a description of sort of this huge number of plants that exist on the face of the earth. We have these small plants, larger plants, medium plants. We have trees of all different sizes. We have thickets, forests, and then also the titular medicinal herbs. Continuing, the Buddha says, yet when a dense cloud blanketing the entire 3,000 great thousandfold world pours forth its rain, it does so at the same time equally on them all. But even though rain is falling on all the plants from the same source, the rainfall of this one cloud makes each of them sprout, grow, blossom, and bear fruit according to its own nature and characteristics. Although growing in the same soil and hydrated by the same rainfall, these plants and trees are all different. To clarify the meaning of this simile, the Buddha explains that his appearance in the world as an awakened being is like the formation of a great cloud. He makes his voice heard by beings in all the realms, offering them liberation, freedom, comfort, and nirvana. He tells them that he's a sage who knows the world as it truly is in the past, present, and future. He's a being who comprehends and knows everything. He knows the way, unfolds the way, and teaches the way. When beings come to listen, the Tathagata determines whether the faculties of all of these beings are keen or dull, this is quoting from the Sutra again, whether they're diligent or lazy, and depending on how much they can take in, his teaching of the Dharma becomes infinitely varied, thereby causing all to rejoice and quickly, quickly gain good benefits. They will be comforted in the present lifetime and afterwards will be born in favorable circumstances, finding joy because of the way and being able to hear the Dharma again. Having heard the Dharma again, they will be free from hindrances, and through those parts of the teachings to which their powers accord, they will eventually embark upon the way. The Dharma taught by the Buddha is of a single flavor and a single attribute. Namely, it is the attribute of emancipation, the attribute of detachment, and the attribute of extinguishment, which is their sort of verb form of nirvana. And it ultimately arrives at the attainment of all-embracing wisdom. And in response to this action by the Buddha, living beings hear the Dharma of the Tathagata and keep, read, recite, and practice it as taught, yet they themselves are not aware of the merits gained thereby. Why is this? Because only the Tathagata understands the kinds, appearances, embodiments, and natures of these living beings. Only he understands the things they reflect upon, things they are thinking, and things they practice. How they reflect, how they think, and how they practice, and by which teachings they ponder, by which teachings they reflect, by which teachings they practice, and by which teachings they attain the fruits of the Dharma. <laughs> He's the only one who, in reality, sees clearly and without hindrances the stages in which living beings reside, but that they are just like those plants, trees, thickets, forests, and medicinal herbs that do not themselves know whether their own capacities are large, medium, or small. And the Tathagata understands this dharma of a single flavor and a single attribute. In other words, it's the attribute of emancipation, the attribute of detachment, the attribute of extinguishment, and the attribute of the ultimate nirvana of tranquil extinguishment that finally comes back to emptiness. The Buddha knowing this and observing the desires in the hearts of all living beings guides and protects them, and for this reason he does not immediately tell them about all-embracing wisdom. And at this point, the Buddha praises Mahakashapa and the great disciples for their ability to comprehend his use of skillful means to teach the Dharma to everyone. It's amazing to him that they not only hear his message, but believe it and receive it, because the Dharma itself is so difficult to understand and, comp and comprehend that Buddhas have only taught it through skillful means so far. And the Buddha restates the gist of this prose section in verse form, which is common throughout the Lotus Sutra. And much of this is the same as the prose section with some added detail and imagery of the Buddha as a cloud bringing lightning, thunder, and rain. And notably, this section ends with the verses, Now for the sake of you all, I will tell you the utmost truth of the matter. None in the multitude of Shravakas has yet attained extinguishment. What you have been undertaking is the Bodhisattva way, and by gradually learning and practicing it, you will all become Buddhas. And this is uh, something that's already been voiced in the sutra before, this notion that um, 
the Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas being sort of part of the, the earlier teachings that we refer to as the Theravadan teachings now, this distinguished from the Mahayana, that actually these people have been practicing the Bodhisattva path the entire time. And this is an idea that's come up already in chapters two and three and four. So in five, it's simply being reiterated. But since we didn't cover those chapters, uh, oh, I might as well bring that up. Next slide, please. So I wanted to call some attention to these are sort of the correspondences that we see in this section of the chapter. And these are explained at length in the text. I didn't want to read them all to you. It's much nicer to have a table, and that's why I gave you one on the sheet as well. And this corresponds to the top table. So in the simile that the Buddha presents, in the verse section, he actually breaks this down into the sections that I have here, where he lists the kind of plants. The smaller medicinal herbs are humans, heavenly beings, wheel-rolling sage kings, and the gods of uh, India that we sort of know, chakra, brahma, etc. These are considered the smaller medicinal herbs. And then the medium medicinal herbs are Pratyeka Buddhas who have mastered the six transcendent powers and practice meditation. And the six transcendent powers will come back in this presentation. So um, just briefly, the six are that you know where all beings are at any time. You can hear sounds that are anywhere in the world. You can know the thoughts of others. You can perceive all of your former lives you have the what's called the cessation of perception and feeling, which is basically like pre nirvana, like you are about to enter nirvana. This is like highest state of meditation you can have without doing it. And then finally, the sixth is insight into nirvana itself. So those would be the six the Pratyeka Buddhas have mastered through meditation. And then the greater medicinal herbs, it doesn't specifically label as bodhisattvas, but it's those who become who resolve to become Buddhas and practice diligence and meditation specifically. And the sort of development that he sees for the folks in these categories is that the Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas have heard the Dharma and they've acquired its fruits, right? They've progressed to a degree and they can sort of reach this level of extinguishment or this sort of smaller and nirvana where uh, they can actually cut off these outflows, purify their minds, develop these transcendent powers, etc. But this isn't the end of the picture. So from here, he gives us the small trees, which are sort of the next level of bodhisattvas, those who have resolved to become Buddhas, and they practice compassion, and they have no doubts, meaning that their strength is both their faith and their compassion. And for them, their sort of development is that they thoroughly fathom the threefold world and begin to seek the highest vehicle, which the text hasn't really referred to it as ekayana at this point, but that's where we're going, that all of the different ways of teaching are all coming together into one one vehicle right and then finally we have the large trees which are the bodhisattvas who abide in transcendent powers think about uh kanan bosatsu or um the bodhisattva wonder sound or jizo or these bodhisattvas who do amazing things right these bodhisattvas who abide in transcendent powers they roll the dharma wheel meaning that they teach the same way that the buddha does and they liberate immeasurable living beings like we see in the bodhisattva vows and for these bodhisattvas, the large trees, their development is that they gain transcendent powers, rejoice on hearing that all things are emptiness, emit countless rays of light, and liberate all living beings. And remember that countless rays of light, um, because there's a lot of vision metaphors that come up as this chapter goes. So, if you read the Kumar Jiva version, that's the end of the chapter, that's where it stops. And this is sometimes still labeled as the parable of the herbs, even though it's not truly a parable. It's sort of a simile of the Buddha as a great cloud and these sort of plants all getting nourishment in their, in their sort of infinite varieties. So from the, at this point in the chapter, I think one of the things that we can see is that there's sort of this idea espoused the Dharma is for everyone in every stage of development. And this is an idea that's already been brought up in just the telling of the story that I brought so far. But also from the verse section, we have something like, for the noble, the humble, the mighty, and the meek, for the precept keepers and the precept breakers, for those who have dignity and refinement, for those who do not have dignity and refinement, for those with right views and those with distorted views, and for those with faculties either keen or dull, equally do I pour forth the reign of the Dharma, never faltering and never tiring. Which sort of flies in the face of this notion that uh, there were people who, they're so bad that the Dharma is not ever going to help them, which was an idea that is well it's still debated by some people but <laughs> we don't necessarily believe that uh, then another key sort of idea here is the oneness of dharma 
which we saw in that the rain and the soil, et cetera, they're nourishing these plants are all coming from a single source. Uh, he elucidates the one Dharma and a wide, with a wide variety of words and terms, though each of them is to the Buddha wisdom as a drop of rain to the ocean. And then we also have the unity of outcome, which is that advancing in practice step by step, everyone will realize fruition of the way. And uh, next slide, please. And those are, that's sort of these key ideas, right? That the Dharma is appropriate for everyone, that the Buddha elucidates one Dharma that's for everyone through various skillful means. And this key phrase that's at the end of the Kumara Jiva version in the Shinazaki translation, at least, I like the way you translate this, advancing step by step, everyone will realize fruition of the way. And then that would be the end of the chapter. So at this point, I actually went over to Hurwitz's version of it, and Leon Hurwitz did a translation in the 1970s, which is a little bit older, and he did something interesting in this chapter. Uh, he has a little note, and he says, here's where Kumar Jiva's translation of this ends, but you probably haven't heard the other half of the chapter. And so he includes the part of the chapter from the Sanskrit version, which is missing from Kumar Jiva's version. And the reason I wanted to bring this in is because Kumara Jiva's version is much more influential in East Asia, and this is the version that we're all more likely to have encountered than uh, versions from the, from the Sanskrit copy. So I wanted to bring this story in because I think it actually builds on the message of this chapter, and we get to hear the real parable of the herbs. And this one's an actual parable. So at this point in the chapter, in the Sanskrit version, the Buddha compares the wisdom of all Buddhas to the light of the sun and the moon that also shines equally on all beings in the lower destinies, even those who intentionally do ill, as well as on bodhisattvas, pratyeka Buddhas, and shravakas. And he clarifies once more that even though the sutras and the Buddhas speak of three vehicles, there is only one dharma. <clears throat> then Kashapa asks him, well, if that's the case, why do the Buddhas speak about three vehicles? And the Buddha responds that potters make pots with one batch of clay. Regardless of what they put inside the pots and the ways that we might designate the pots when we say, ah, oh, this is a sugar pot, this is a pot for clarified butter, this is a pot for milk. And he even mentions uh, pots for filth, which I'm pretty sure are somewhat like a bedpan, if you can imagine. He says that those pots are actually all still made of the same clay, regardless of what they contain. They all come from the same source. And Kashapa then asked the Buddha if nirvana is different based on the predispositions of those who attain it. We understand the dharmas for everybody, and that sort of they cultivate based on the variety of capacity they have, etc. So do they all do they all get the same attainment? Do they all awaken to the same degree? And the Buddha says, well, you know, intelligent people can understand things through parables. So I'll tell you in the form of a parable. And here we get the parable of the herbs. The next slide, please. And we're back. So at this point, the Buddha tells Kashapa that there is a man who was born blind, who we'll refer to as the congenitally blind man, because that's how Herbert translates it. And he goes around telling people that there are no sightly or unsightly shapes, no viewers of sightly or unsightly shapes, no sun and moon, no stars, no planets, or even people who see the planets or any of those things. Well, obviously, other people delight a lot in telling him that he is wrong, but he doesn't listen to them. He argues with them. And he won't accept what they say, no matter what. But there's a physician in the area, and he's not just any physician, right? This is an extremely skilled physician who knows the ins and outs of diagnosing all kinds of diseases. He understands that diseases are caused by imbalances of the various humors, and he's sort of figured out how to master these through treating them with various medicinal herbs. And so he's thinking through, you know, he looks at this person, he sees his situation, and he says, really, you know, he feels compassion for this man. He sees that from the perspective of this man who was born blind, that he truly cannot accept all these claims that people are making. It sounds like they're putting him on. And so out of compassion, he thinks about where could I possibly find herbs that will cure this type of blindness that this person was born with. And there's only one location he can think of, which is a mountain called the Snowy King of Mountains. And it's actually really difficult to get there. So he spends a lot of time planning and he comes up with a sort of scheme to get there and makes the arduous journey to this mountain to recover four herbs. The first one is called the one possessed of all colors, flavors, and states of being. The second one is called the one that brings release from all ailments. The third is called the one that destroys all poisons. And the fourth is called the one that confers happiness on those standing in the right place. Hope you're standing there when you get it. <laughs> so it's an arduous journey, but the physician makes the trip out of compassion for this blind man, and he administers the herbs to him in various ways. 
and this is quoting Herbitz, he gives the blind man one chewed with his teeth, one he gives him pounded, one he gives him cooked in a mixture with other things, one he gives him mixed with other things raw, one he gives him after piercing his body with a lancet, one he gives him after burning it in fire, one he gives him mixed with a variety of things, including even such things as food, drink, and the like. And you know what? It works. It's a very strong treatment program, but it actually cures this man's blindness, and he sees for the first time in his life. And the congenitally blind man can now see that all the things that he couldn't see before, and the first thing he says is, oh, what a fool. <laughs> I was... What a fool I was in not believing those who spoke to me earlier and not accepting what they said. Mm -hmm. I now see everything. I'm released from blindness. I've regained my sight. There's now no one superior to me. And that's where maybe he needed to pump the brakes for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so. Like he hadn't changed. <laughs> well, he learned a little bit, but not quite enough. So now he believes there are planets and the sun and the moon, and there are people who see those, and there are things that are pleasant to look at and things that aren't pleasant to look at. So now he is superior to everyone else because he has that knowledge. And at this point, some religious seers approach him, and uh, they're endowed with the five kinds of super knowledge, which we looked at the six earlier for the medium. Um, yeah, so it was the, the medium, medium uh, medicinal herbs. So the six transcendent powers, the five is those without the insight into nirvana. So he meets some seers who are endowed with the five kinds of super knowledge. They're skilled in the heavenly eye, which is how they see people everywhere, the heavenly ear, which is how they hear them everywhere, in knowledge of the thoughts of others, in the knowledge consisting of recollection of former states of being or lifetimes, and in supernatural power in general and in the achievement of deliverance or nirvana. And here's what they say to him. Sir, you have merely regained your sight, but you do not know anything. <laughs> Whence comes your arrogance? For you have no wisdom, and you are not learned. They speak to him in this way. When you, sir, seated in your inner house, neither see nor know other forms outside, nor which beings are well disposed to you, nor which ill disposed, and when you cannot discern or understand or hear the sound of a man standing five leagues away and talking, or of a drum, or of a conch shell, or the like, and when you cannot go more than a league without lifting your feet, and when you were born and grew in your mother's womb, and remember none of these acts, in what sense are you wise? And how can you say, I see everything? Very well, sir. Take darkness for light and light for darkness, if that is what you wish. And this actually seems to get across to him a little bit. Um, and at this point, he says, you know, he's been swayed. He says, okay, fine, like, indulge me. Like, how do I, how do I cultivate these kinds of super knowledge, right? And they tell him, well, it's quite simple. Uh, what you need to do is abandon your life and go live in the forest or a mountain cave thinking only of the Dharma and eliminate all of your defilements. And you know what? He just goes and does that. He moves to the forest and he meditates and he forsakes his worldly cravings and he attains the super knowledges. And at the conclusion of the parable, he thinks the following. Whatever other deed I might have done formerly, no good quality ever accrued to me because of it. Now I go wherever I think to go, whereas formerly I was a person of slight wisdom and slight experience, a blind man. The end. Uh, next slide, please. So in this chapter, we have sort of a different set of these correspondences, which uh, I put in the lower table on there. So in this case, we have the congenitally blind man while he's still blind, and the Buddha says uh, that this represents the beings who are in the six destinies. So this is the hell dwellers, the animals, the asuras, the human beings, the gods, and hungry ghosts. The, once the blind man has had his sight restored, this puts him among, essentially, the Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas. They see, and they know a lot, but they're somewhere in between, right? They haven't really reached this full awakening that the Buddha wants to give them, this, this ability to eventually become Buddhas themselves. But they're also not trapped in the Six Destinies anymore. They have the tools of some level of liberation where they can start to sort of see beyond what it means to just be the average human being. And then the seers with super knowledge represent bodhisattvas who accept the doctrine of unproduced dharmas. And I put this note, the Madhyamaka understanding of emptiness, because uh, Herbert actually points that out specifically, that um, he sees this use of the term unproduced dharmas 
as being a specific reference to the sort of Madhyamaka philosophy of the uh, sort of uh, transcendence of shunyata, of, of emptiness to a degree that none of the phenomena have really been produced, we're sort of experiencing this flux of, of emptiness. And then the physician in the parable is quite clearly the Buddha. Um, the wind, bile, and phlegm, which are mentioned more in the actual prose section of this, correspond to, as Herbert translates them, lust, hatred, and delusion, but we should understand the three poisons of uh, greed, anger, and delusion. <laughs> Get tripped up, I've heard too many translations now. As well as the 62 mistaken views. And if you're interested in learning more about the 62 mistaken views, there are the 62 views um, that come from the Nikayas that all relate to sort of the errors in thinking that come from eternalism, annihilationism, the notion of having a self, etc. I got a sheet, but I decided to spare everyone. <laughs> so, yes, it's fair. Um. You need your magnifying glass for this one. Um, and then the four herbs represent the gateway to nirvana. And in the sutra, it's a, it mentions emptiness, signlessness, and wishlessness, which if you look in the commentary to the large Prajnaparamita Sutra, the Nagarjuna's commentary. He spends a little bit of time sort of talking about these three, and they're considered three bodhisattva samadhis. So emptiness, we're very familiar with uh, the notion of shunyata, that all of the phenomena don't really have any substantial phenomena-ness, right? The qualities are all sort of coming from somewhere else. But then with that as sort of the initial step, then he moves on to wishlessness, which is that sort of as a consequence of that experience of emptiness, it sort of seems strange for us then to continue to pin our desires onto things, to try and sort of have this, this hope for the future in a sense of, oh, I have this expectation that this, this, and this is going to go on. In a state of perfect sort of concentrated equanimity, one would no longer have that as a result of emptiness. And then the sort of signlessness, um, Herbert's explanation is... <laughs> Hertz's explanation is the signlessness refers to a lack of significance in what are commonly regarded as signs. <laughs> I'm sure that's very helpful. <laughs> um, yeah, really unfortunately, the Tachi Talun is not actually uh, that much more helpful in like a nice quick definition, but we should sort of understand this based on context of we no longer really cling on to the sort of conceptual verbal designation part of things, right? We understand that we merely have many ways of speaking, right? It's not, the words are not the truth anymore. So that was mainly for an FYI, just because you'll see those terms many times in Mahayana Sutras. So uh, next slide, please. So with regard to this parable, one of the things that we see repeatedly is this notion of ignorance as an inability to see in a metaphorical sense. And interestingly enough, ignorance, when we talk about it in context of Buddhism, in Sanskrit is avidya, which shares a root with video, which we all might be familiar with, which is very much sight-based. And then in uh, Japanese, we have mumyo, which is basically without light. And so this is something that's not illuminated, right? And so in this sense, the metaphor of seeing is really multivalent in a lot of Buddhist texts. So we also saw it in the light of the sun and the moon being important in how the Buddha is disseminating knowledge to people, the beam of light that comes out of the Buddha's third eye to illuminate the various worlds so that other people can see them, etc., etc. You look around, you're going to see lights everywhere. So for those in the six destinies, the text says that they augment the darkness of their impurities. This is a quote from the Hurvitz. For they're blind with ignorance, and being blind with ignorance, heap up predispositions, or samskara, and going back to predispositions, name and form, and so on, until this whole great mass of suffering has taken shape, which we might recognize as a reference to the chain of dependent origination, starting from ignorance up to dukkha, which again is because they augment their darkness and they don't see. The Tathagata sees them with the eye of wisdom, and can discern the relative strengths and weaknesses of the wholesome and unwholesome deeds each being has performed. Also, we have then the Tathagata presents the three vehicles, and this causes beings to become bodhisattvas who develop 
an enlightened intuition or prajna, as um, Purvitz translates it as enlightened intuition, again, with the metaphor of light being part of knowledge or uh, wisdom, sorry, prajna in this sense. And thus we should have the attitude that ignorance is a curable condition and not someone's nature. The imbalance of greed, anger, and delusion, and the 62 mistaken views cause the condition of ignorance in the body. Emptiness, signlessness, and wishlessness are applied medicinally to help us regain our vision. And the restoration of vision breaks the chain of dependent origination, which results in liberation from dukkha. So there's a little bit about the uh, attitudes toward the sort of non ekayana practitioners as well. And in this section, we see that those who believe they've attained nirvana or, with, or awakening without being on the bodhisattva path have regained their vision. They have a right view and are eliminating defilements and ignorance, but they're still sort of caught in this in-between state between ignorance and awakening. They're not fully awakened, but they're on the path. They've started awakening. And so in that sense, they're actually very discerning, but still not necessarily ready, perhaps, to see the ultimate truth. Then also we see that non ekayana practitioners should be encouraged to reflect on the insufficiency of their experience of extinction. In other words, uh, encourage people to work through this on their own to some extent, instead of berating them and telling them you are doing this wrong, which is what we see in the story. They're a little harsh with him, but they do encourage him to really think about, like, what is it that you're doing that makes you so wise and superior? And that's what it takes, is he has to make that decision for himself. So the goals of Ekayana, as described in this chapter, and I'm taking this directly from Hermes, and this is how the Buddha characterizes sort of the end of this section when he's speaking directly to Kashapa. He says, the thought of enlightened intuition having been excited within him, he neither stands in the round of transmigration nor attains to extinction. Having understood, he sees the world of the triple sphere in its ten directions as empty, a fabrication, a mock creation, a dream, a mirage, an echo. He sees all dharmas as unoriginated, unsuppressed, unbound, unreleased, not dark, and not bright. Whoever sees the profound dharmas in this way, he with non-vision sees the whole triple world as full, assigned as an abode to a variety of beings. And this is again summarized in verse, but I think I'll spare you because this basically says just about the same thing. It's a little more pretty. Next slide, please. So at this point, I kind of tried to look at this overall chapter because I hadn't really studied it this way before. I only looked at the sort of uh, the simile of the herbs, we'll call it. So I tried to kind of pull some messages out of this that really spoke to me. And the first one that I kind of looked at here was this notion that, that everything and everyone has a place in this story. And I think that's an important part of it. So we can see from the story that every being has its place in the world and the universe because it is part of the world and the universe. And this is displayed by all the plants, regardless of their variety, being nourished by the same substance. In this case, Buddha Dharma, represented by the rain. And the other side of that statement is that the diversity of beings is a result of Buddha nature and not something that happens despite it. All the plants are developing and growing, but they are not becoming some sort of homogenous plant group. All beings are on the Buddha path, regardless of if they are conscious of it or not. This is not limited to followers of the three vehicles, the Shravakas, Pratyeka Buddhas, and Bodhisattvas, but presumably it would also be true of non-Buddhists as well, based on the story in this sutra. Also, uh, our consciousness of our place in the world and the nature of reality are, by their very nature, incomplete. The plants in the parable have no understanding of the meaning or purpose of their development, they simply grow. Likewise, the congenitally blind man advances without a full understanding of the truth he is pursuing. Nonetheless, he advances. Our compassion for others is a driving force that allows everyone to advance, which is evidence in the actions of the physician as well as the seers in the parable. When they see something wrong, it's not enough to just say, wow, that's messed up. Well, I got my stuff set, so hope you figure it out. They see problems around them, and what they do is they go face the problem head on, and they do it out of compassion for the people around them. 
And that attitude of compassion toward everyone moves the whole of all sentient beings forward. Ignorance, in a Buddhist sense, is not anyone's fault. It's a force of nature, the default state of a human being. We are congenitally ignorant, and this is the source of our suffering. But I could call it maybe our pre-human, real default is actually Buddha nature. This is the manifestation of emptiness as a positive, animating, and a harmonious force of life. And in this sense, we are on a path to awakening regardless of if we are willing to acknowledge it or even if we want to be. Next slide, please. So these are a little bit of uh, some things that I've drawn together from looking at this. My personal favorite is have fun. I didn't put an exclamation point though because we're very serious tonight. <laughs> so first, the images and stories of the Lotus Sutra really do speak for themselves, which is why I quoted heavily from Shinazaki's translation as well as from Hurwitz's translation. And this is true of the parable of the herbs as well, even though it's a relatively short chapter. Hearing interpretations helps guide our reading, but we can always find new and interesting readings on our own and in fact, this is exactly what the parable of the herbs is saying. The Sutra of Innumerable Meanings, which is sometimes considered the introductory sutra to the Lotus Sutra, says of the Dharma, capital D, that it is guarded and protected by the Buddhas of the past, present, and future. It is impervious to hordes of Maras and swarms of wayward teachings. It cannot be defeated by any distorted views or destroyed by birth and death. In other words, you're not going to break the Dharma by reading it badly. However, you should do your best to use it in good faith. And the reasoning is that you can cause great harm and damage to yourself and others. But then again, this is true of all of our actions, regardless of if we want to acknowledge our responsibility or not. Again, the profound and difficult to understand teachings of Buddhism are things that we will experience and are experiencing now. They don't happen in some sort of abstract vacuum. They all speak to life and experience. This is their origin point. When we encounter confusing teachings, we are getting what we need out of them right now. A sense of discomfort, of productive unease that pushes us forward to new experiences and insights. However, when the time is right, we will experience recognition instead of confusion. And then also try different practices and studying different texts. There are innumerable ways to grow and develop your Buddha nature, and it can be surprising which practices turn out to be productive. For me, a personal favorite became sweeping this house. I actually think that I made more progress doing that than in years of meditating an hour every morning. And then of course, lastly, please have fun. Next slide, please. And with that, let's open it up for questions, <laughs> comments, and thoughts. Uh, he's gathering medicinal herbs. And, he's <laughs> and fertilizing the soil. Yes, he's growing more herbs. Um, so first, I would like to ask if uh, Ichishima Sensei has any comments, uh, and then also you, Mochin Sensei. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a very interesting discussion. And... Uh, I think uh, ignorance, abhidaya, really uh, points of awareness, <coughs> uh, consciousness. Recently, I uh, learned that uh, some American scholar, uh, brain scientist, uh, it, he talks about uh, chaos attractor. Chaos attractor really produces uh, our mind and which connect to the 12 link of dependent origination. The third point is ignorance. How to uh, bring our ignorance to gnosis? This is a point, I think, and of course, herb, herbs are uh, <clears throat> very important for uh, human beings, as well as any animals. Uh, I think... Uh, mm, Hongaku Shiso, or, you know, original sort of enlightenment really developed together with our nature. Nature really helps us awakening. 
So this is uh, my comment. Very poor comment. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Sensei. You. And uh, Sensei, if you had anything you'd like yeah. to add. I, I was just going to comment on something that, that is not quite as profound as Ichishima Sensei's comment. But it's just that when you looking at that chart of the herbs um, and, and the list, I think it was the second chart, in which you look at um, wind, bile, and phlegm as related to uh, lust, anger, etc. Um, when you look at Asian medical systems, the three phlegm, the three humors are found in Ayurveda and in Tibetan medicine and the degree to which the mundane being that of the medicinal systems that existed in Tibet and in India were found also in the Lotus Sutra and the degree to which the Lotus Sutra then had a profound effect on the medical systems and it's it's keep in mind that in the Tibetan system there are four books that are the primary volumes Three are dealing with spiritual illnesses. Only one deals with what we think of as anatomy, physiology. But even the anatomy and physiology is broken down into the three humors of wind, bile, and phlegm. And so you see how the Lotus Sutra had a profound effect on Indian culture as well as, as Tibetan culture and lesser effect on, on Chinese culture because it came uh, you know, much uh, at a different time. Uh, and and Tibet and the Chinese medical systems, which are more Taoist in in origin, compared to the Indian systems, which are Ayurvedic, and also from from the Buddhist teachings. And of course, Shakyamuni Buddha is considered the physician. <laughs> and so, so I, I I just found that I just find that really interesting. So you see the the penetration of the teaching into everyday life in a way that we might not normally be aware of. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you for that.